Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. I punish children for their parents' sins, even to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But I am loyal and gracious to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Do not use the Lord's na- your God's name in vain as if it were no, of no significance. The Lord won't forgive anyone who uses his name that way. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Six days you may work and do all your tasks, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do not do any work on it, not you, your sons or daughters, your male or female servants, your animals, or the immigrant who is living with you. Because the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them in six days, but rested on the seventh day, that is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your life will be long on the fertile land that the Lord your God is giving you. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's house. Do not desire and try to take your neighbor's life, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Hear what the the Spirit is saying to God's people. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth the work of God's hands. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, In the deep, God's God set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where, to be, where are to be today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the, through, uh, who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews asked for signs. The Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a, is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and, and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because of the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human spirit. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord. I spent this week pondering, what is there to learn from Jesus' anger? But first, we have have to spend some time with the question, what can we learn about Jesus' anger? This story in today's Gospels appears in all four of the Gospels, which is really rare. And that means that it's really important. But it's differently important in the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story appears at the end of Jesus' life, after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's almost like the last straw that turns the tide and points out the danger that Jesus has become and gives the authorities any excuse to kill him. It's almost like a taunt, come and get me, bro. But in John, it's different. It's at the beginning. This is only the second chapter of John, and it says something about who Jesus is and what his ministry is about. And biblical scholars have all kinds of thoughts about this, which we're going to get to in just a minute. But before we do that, we have to put aside some assumptions that we have about this text. Amy Jill Levine, who's a biblical scholar from Vanderbilt, says we have to unlearn everything that Hollywood has taught us about this story, where it's a huge disruption and everything comes to a halt. Jesus is screaming, and you kind of hear this pin drop moment in the temple. But you have to remember that the temple complex is huge. It's as big as 12 soccer fields put end to end. And the disruption at one end wouldn't really cause much of any um, awareness in another part of the complex. It's mostly symbolic and mostly for his followers. So then what is this symbolic tantrum about? One idea is that Jesus is disrupting or protesting a financial and economic system of exploitation. And there's really no evidence for this in the text, despite I have definitely heard a lot of sermons about this angle of it. And that might have its roots in medieval anti-Semitism 
Because Christians weren't allowed to lend money to other Christians, that role was a role that Jews played in society. And Jews at the time were seen with distrust at best and hatred at worst. The church was already suspicious of Jewish people and anything that the Jews did related to money. So it's, it's really likely that that anti-Jewish bias was read back into this text. And changing money and lending money got confused. These folks are not predatory loan sharks hanging around and taking advantage of people. Instead, they're offering an important and necessary service, which is currency exchange. Because Jewish people couldn't use coins that had the Roman emperor's face on it in the temple, because the Rome taught that the emperor was God. But the Jews already had a God, which was Yahweh. So these money changers were taking this image with a graven image on it and removing the stain of empire. This system gave people a way to trade their everyday money for special money, for a special purpose, money that could help people participate in the activities of the temple. Now, I realize that Arlo Washington is with us today, and he's the expert on expansive and inclusive banking systems, not me. But I'm guessing that we would agree that enabling people to have access to financial and economic instruments that enable them to meet their goals is a good thing. The money changers were helping to make that happen, not getting in the way of it. And also, people liked this system because it was convenient. If you were traveling a long way on foot to offer a special sacrifice to God, you didn't want to risk your dove flying off en route or your sheep that was supposed to be unblemished getting injured along the way. You could buy it when you arrived. That meant that you had a healthy animal and it was less hassle for you. Another view about what Jesus is upset about is that he's protesting the ritual purity laws. But if you'll remember the stories of Jesus' healing, he actually helps restore people to a state of ritual purity. He heals people and then tells them to go and present themselves to the authorities, the religious authorities, to be integrated back into society. Another view says that Jesus hates the temple and everything that it stands for. But that's not right either, because he calls the temple his father's house. And it's clear that he values the temple. He made the required pilgrimages there. So if Jesus isn't protesting the temple itself, or the economic system, or the role of religious purity, why is he so mad? And he is really mad. I mean, in this version, the version of John, he's almost violent. He makes this weapon, this whip. And anger like that often makes us, it often makes me really uncomfortable. We're fearful of anger, almost to a point of phobia, for a really good reason. Just look at the vitriol that characterizes our political discourse or our online interactions with people, or the tragedies we see at the hands of disgruntled people with access to high power weapons and a score to settle. We tend to value politeness and repress or stuff down our anger. But anger can be helpful too, because anger can show us what's wrong Anger can show us what needs our attention and our energy. A clinical psychologist says that anger is like anxiety. It's a reaction to something that is threatening. It's threatening our physical, or our psychological, or our spiritual, or our existential integrity. And like other species, without this capacity for anger or even rage, we would be unable to defend ourselves or those we love when we really needed it. We would be unable to fight for freedom and what we truly believe in and value. My friends, anger tells us something. It tells us what we value and when those values are being violated. And Jesus got angry. He allowed his anger. He was able to see that things were wrong and then allowed that emotion to emerge as a form of truth telling. He was able to name how the world was out of alignment with his vision and his values. The disciples understood this anger as a display of Jesus's passion or zeal. 
The word zeal, which we hear today as passion, it literally comes from the word to boil. It means hot enough to boil. And this can be positive or negative. It's used both ways in scripture. It can be negative, like jealousy or rage, but it can also be positive, like passion, burning, bubbling over with love, or even with anger. And this is good news to me, because it means that Jesus is not tepid. Jesus is not lukewarm. In fact, following Jesus means boiling over in some kind of way, to have kind of a boiling hot faith. And things that are that hot, steam, can move a locomotive, can power a factory. Hot water can make a great cup of tea. So what heats you up? What gets you boiling? Brene Brown says that anger is a beautiful, necessary catalyst for change. But anger needs to ignite something. It is a terrible lifetime companion but it is a very important catalyst for change. When we see something that's unfair, our response of anger is what fuels that change, but to stay in it perpetually, there's a lot of physical and emotional and spiritual costs. So the first thing that we can learn from Jesus' anger is that we also are allowed to get angry. We're allowed to boil over. In fact, living a robust life of faith means that some things, some injustices, they are beyond the pale. But we don't get angry for anger's sake, and we don't allow ourselves to dwell there. I want to be clear, I'm not standing up here and saying you can be angry all the time. (laughs) The fruits of the Spirit, after all, are gentleness and self-control. But what I am saying is that when you feel the heat of anger, you can attend to it. You don't have to stuff it down or ignore it. You can listen for what it's trying to tell you. The second thing we can learn from Jesus' anger is what he's mad about. For Jesus, the temple should be a place of transformation, not transaction. The marketplace is about give and take, tit for tat, an exchange of equal, relatively equal value. It's tempting, isn't it, to spend time in prayer and receive in response a clear head for the day, to receive the broken bread and get a clear, a burst of calm that carries you through the week, or to make your confession a few times a year and to leave with a lighter heart. Now that happens, and that is good. Those are some of the graces that we receive through our religious practices. But our religious practices are not primarily about what we receive, how they make us more productive or happier. At their best, our religious practices should be where we expect to encounter and be transformed by God. It's about transformation, not transaction. Our Eucharistic prayer says, deliver us, O Lord, from from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. What Jesus is also saying, I think, is that those moments of transformation are not only limited to explicitly religious places. God promises to meet us in the sacraments and is always present there, but God is also present in all kinds of ways and places. Dr. Levine thinks that what Jesus is also angry about is a division that we've created in our lives. This quote of Jesus says, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. That's a reference to Zechariah in chapter 14, and it's a, a passage that's a prophecy describing a day that is coming, a day that is marked by unity between God and all the people and unity among all the people on earth. And it says, on that day, the pots in the Lord's house will be holy like the bowls before the altar, and every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy. There will no longer be any merchants in the house of the Lord on that day. On that day, every single ordinary cooking pot will be as holy as a chalice. 
What Jesus is saying, what he is envisioning, is a world where there's no longer a boundary between the sacred and the so-called profane. Jesus wants to extend the holiness of the temple to everyone, to all people in all places. That actually makes him like the Pharisees, who also wanted to extend the holiness of the temple. Perhaps this kind of extended holiness looks like a world in which a cup of tea offers as much blessing as a chalice. A righteous outcry of rage from a friend becomes as stirring as a gospel proclamation. A world in which every time we sit down with one another and break bread, that moment is as holy and as sacred to us as our weekly ceremonial feast with special bread and special plates and special napkins and special outfits and in a special place. Jesus is imagining a world in which we don't have to offer particular sacrifices to God because we understand our whole life to be a sacrifice. A world in which our religion is not just something that happens at the temple or at the church house, but is an ongoing prayer that bursts forth every morning that we rise from our bed and every time our lungs take another breath. A world in which our faith is not primarily about going to religious places and doing religious things, but is a way in which we live and move and have our being. A way that flows through our veins and bubbles up in compassion and love and yes, sometimes even anger. God doesn't need our unblemished lambs. Jesus was our unblemished lamb. God wants our whole selves, blemishes and all. All of our life is a sacrifice and offering to God, not just what we drop in the offering plate or the version of ourselves that we present to the world when we're feeling particularly put together. The other thing we can take from this story is that anger can be holy. Anger shows us when our values are being violated Anger, rightly channeled, moves us to action, to deeper love. It shows us what moves in us and what is boiling in us. So my friends, what gets you angry? What gets you fired up? That shows you what you love and what you deeply desire. Jesus loves a world in which all things and all people are holy. Jesus loves a world in which the boundary between the sacred and the profane is erased. Jesus loves a world in which religion is not just a thing you do a few hours a week, but an entire way of life. So what about you? Where is your zeal? What consumes you, enrages you, stirs up your blood, and makes it boil? Fighting with strangers on the internet? Your passion for your favorite sports team? A slow checker at the grocery store? Or is it the massacre happening in Gaza? Is it a non-binary teen being attacked in a school bathroom? Is it deep-seated iniquities in our social, educational, and financial systems? Is it injustice and pain in your family? Is it the ways in which the powerful abuse and take advantage of the weak? Jesus' body, in all of its emotion, in all of its biological and physiological realness, is the temple. His body and the things his body does are holy. We are his body too, and we are united in his body. And that means our bodies, our emotions, our ordinary cooking pots can be conduits for the holy as well. Jesus shows us that rage can be holy. It's holy because it shows you what's wrong. And it's holy because it shows you the gap between the world as it is and the world as it could and should be. This is part of our Lenten practice tapping into what disturbs you, what enrages you, not to dwell there, but to allow it to move in you and through you, to ignite your action, 
action that leads to holiness and fullness of life. This is the way of the cross. It's foolishness to some, for sure. But to followers of Jesus, it is God's wisdom, God's way, and God's power. in Jesus' name. When wealth is used to gain control, the prophet's call is clear. If money muzzles to dissent, the victor will be fear. When Christ came to the temple mount and sought a sacred space, instead of shelter fit for prayer, he found a marketplace. He flipped the tables of their Rain cannot be monetized, his love cannot be bought. Forgive us, Jesus of the poor, for courage quickly lost. When we choose might instead of right, and shirk redemption's cost. And as you cleanse the temple floor, come cleanse our motives too. Our conscience neither bought nor sold, but only formed by you. O Spirit, come and strengthen us to follow Christ's own way. To speak and act the truth in love, now freed from love. 